300 years before that was when Columbus returned from his first voyage and said, guess what, folks? There's, there's other continents out there and other people. And uh, so that set off a, a frantic race among the major European powers, uh, sending out explorers all over the world, looking for new lands and uh, looking for new ways to get to China. So the Vancouver expedition, let's see, let's go back to the first slide for a second, yeah. The Vancouver expedition left England the previous year, 1791, with several assignments. Uh, first, follow up on the previous voyages of Captain Cook, James Cook, uh, to the Pacific and the west coast of North America, uh, including settling a dispute with the Spanish which had taken place uh, a few years earlier, uh, somewhere on the coast of an island, a large island to the north of where we are today, tonight. Uh, secondly, to make contact with uh, indigenous people everywhere and establish peaceful relations with them that would foster trade and commerce. Uh, maybe to establish some kind of claim or perhaps a protectorate to give the Brits you know, a leg up on the ensuing rush <laughs> out of Europe. Uh, thirdly, to find, uh, which was sort of the holy grail of the explorers at that time, the fabled Northwest Passage, which would allow, especially the Brits, provide them a way to get uh, over to China on a shortcut, not have to go around Cape Horn in South America. So George Vancouver is pictured here was uh, the ideal choice for this assignment. Uh, as a veteran of Cook's voyages, he, he knew his way around the Pacific and he knew his way around the ship. And he was a man uh, known for his humanity, uh, his ability to respect and promote good relations with the, the non-Europeans. And as witness to his accomplishments, that large island somewhere to the north of us and a major world city to the north of us uh, bear his name to this day. So May uh, 1792 found Vancouver and his two ships, the Discovery and the Chatham, anchored somewhere near present-day Seattle. Uh, uncertain as to what lay south in this large body of water that Europeans had not yet visited, uh, Vancouver assigned his able lieutenant, Peter Puget, to an exploring expedition of his own to take 16 men and two longboats. I guess you could show the next slide. This is, <laughs> that gives the overall idea of where Vancouver went on his voyage. Voyages, it was a long one. Anyway, he sent Peter Puget with 16 men and two longboats to have a look-see uh, and return to the main ship within seven days. Uh, we, I know you're gonna be disappointed. We were going to have Harold Barrett come and tell you about the adventures of these men, but he inexplicably failed to show up tonight. So uh, fortunately, through the uh, ad recent advances in time travel, we have here tonight a participant of the 1792 expedition, Adam Brown, an able-bodied seaman of the His Majesty's arm tender Chatham. So without further ado, May I uh, introduce to you, and may you make welcome, Mr. Adam Brown. Sunday, May 20th. Early in the morning, we left the ships with the two boats, well armed. The launch carried two swivels, besides wall pieces, musketoons, and muskets, and provided with a week's provisions, we began the examination of the inlet. We found it trend nearly south for about four leagues, and in that distance, preserving the breadth of one mile, we were there induced to stop for breakfast, in hopes of enticing two Indians who had deserted their canoe and fled to the woods to come to us. She was hauled up close to the trees, and before we went away, some beads, metals, and trinkets were put among their other articles in the canoe as proof 
that our intentions were friendly. At the back of this place is a small lagoon, and as the tide was out, the water in it was perfectly fresh. The entrance is sufficiently large to admit the Chatham, to go in at high water, as the tide had by the high water mark then fallen 14 feet. The land here is in general low and rising gradually a little distance from the beach to hills of a moderate height and is everywhere covered with wood consisting chiefly of tall straight pine trees. About nine we left the breakfast place with a fine fair wind and tide and proceeded on a further investigation of the inlet which still continued its breadth and direction. Soundings were frequently tried for, but no bottom could be reached with 40 fathoms of line. About four miles from the breakfast place, the eastern shore, which had hitherto been compact, branched off to the eastward and afforded us a view of an excessive high snowy mountain. Passing the eastern branch, we continued our progress along the starboard, or continental, shore, which still was in a southerly direction and of the same breadth. A most rapid tide from the northward hurried us so fast past the shore that we could scarce land. In mid-channel, we found 30 fathoms of water, soft bottom. Two canoes who had for some time been paddling in shore, one with four, the other with two Indians in them, immediately on our hauling in with an intention to land, struck off into the stream and endeavoring to increase their distance from us. Nor could all the signs emblematical of friendship, such as a white handkerchief, a green bow, and many other methods, induce them to venture near us. On the contrary, it appeared to have another effect, that of redoubling their efforts in getting away. At the distance of about six leagues from the breakfast place, the continent took a sudden turn to the westward, and from this direction the flood came so strong that all our efforts could not make way against it. We therefore landed to dine on the point. This we left about three in the afternoon and proceeding along the shore of this western branch. About a mile from the dinner place, we found a small cove, at the head of which were a party of 17 or 18 Indians in temporary habitations, drawing clams, fish, etc., which they readily parted with for buttons, trinkets, and they did not appear the least alarmed at our approach, but immediately offered their articles for sale. In their persons, these people were slenderly made and wear their hair long, which is quite black and exceeding dirty. Both nose and ears are perforated, to the which were affixed copper ornaments and beads. The whole party was naked. The land here is flat for the base of a quarter of a mile, rising gradually to the back hills, which everywhere is thickly covered in large pines and difficult of being penetrated. The soil appeared good and produced a quantity of gooseberry, raspberry, and currant bushes, now highly in blossom, which intermixed with roses, exhibited a strange variegation of flowers, but by no means unpleasant to the eye. We left Indian Cove and proceeded along the continental shore, which still trended to the eastward, and about three leagues from the dinner point at eight, we brought two for the night. We found the larboard or southern shore composed of islands. To this situation, two canoes, who had been our attendants from the last cove, and now they lay on their paddles about 100 yards from the beach, attentively viewing our operations. In the boats were some firearms that in the course of the day had been found defective, and we now wish them to be discharged. But the fear of alarming the Indians prevented us from doing it. 
Finding, however, they still kept hovering about the boat, and being apprehensive they would be endeavoring to commit depredations during the night, Lieutenant Puget ordered a musket to be fired, but so far was it from intimidating or alarming them that they remained stationary, only exclaiming pop at every report in way of derision. They, however, soon after left us, nor did they trouble us afterwards. Monday, May 21st. We quitted our quarters early on Monday morning, May 21st, though it rained. We proceeded on our examination of this western branch. The tide prevented our making any considerable progress before stopping for breakfast on a small island inhabited by an astonishing quantity of crows. After breakfast, we continued pulling for the head of the branch, then back to the south where we saw an Indian village. We lay on our oars while a canoe came out towards us, but despite trying, despite trying to allure them with copper and other articles, they would not come close to our boats. They lay about 20 yards from us and kept pointing to the eastward, expressing to us they wished us to depart. <laughs> Lieutenant Puget did not wish to quit these surly gentlemen altogether without giving some evident proof that our intention was perfectly friendly. So he hit on the idea of tying some copper medals, looking glasses, and other articles on a piece of wood and left floating on the water, then pulling away to a small distance. The Indians immediately picked them up. This was repeated two or three times and was successful as they came alongside the boat. In their persons, they were apparently more stout than any Indians we have hitherto seen on the coast. Two or three in the canoe had lost the right eye and were much pitted with the smallpox. They seemed shy and distrustful, even despite our gifts and attempts to use the common words we had learned from the other natives. In our questions, they only answered po, po, and pointing to Crow Island, alluding to the report of the muskets at breakfast. They wanted copper, but were unwilling to trade their bows and arrows, which were very neat and well-constructed, and of which they had plenty. During this effort to win their friendship, we kept paddling easily along our intended route so that no time would be lost. As we increased our distance from the village, the Indians returned back to it. The weather was extremely sultry. The thermometer was at 90 degrees. We pulled into a small cove on the south shore of this western branch to dine. We were about to try the seine for salmon when six canoes appeared. These canoes contained about 20 men, all armed. Among them I saw the three who had before been to us. They paddled close to us, and some immediately landed. On their approach, a line was drawn to divide the two parties. The Indians perfectly understood and kept to their side. As a rule, we always landed with two or four, or three or four muskets with us, and on this occasion, we luckily had not forgot. We would have appeared very unguarded if we had been if we had to retrieve our arms from the boats after the arrival of this party. We had proposed to dine on a cliff about six yards from the boats. Another canoe arrived with four more Indians. For our security, we took every precaution to prevent a surprise from our visitors, some who were landed on the beach and some in their boats. As good order appeared to be pretty well established, we went to dinner ourselves on the hill and the boat crews, their respective boats, ready with their firearms. Nearly after our sitting down, the Indians quitted the beach and repaired to their canoes, where an apparent consultation was held 
about our party as they frequently pointed to the boats and to us on the hill. I now began to think they seriously meant to attack us during the division of the party. Lieutenant Puget wished to signal to our visitors that we were calm but ready to defend ourselves. The three canoes were stealing toward the boats, but retreated when they perceived they were discovered by those on the hill. Another canoe approached the party and suddenly jumped on the beach, stringing their bows and apparently preparing for an, atta an attack. I heard Lieutenant Puget tell those on the hill that he was in an awkward predicament. Not willing to fire on these poor people, and not wishing to run the risk of having us wounded by the first discharge of their arrows. He saw a young Indian ascending the hill about five yards from us with his bow and arrow ready. However, his companions called him back to the beach. Our people on the beach were removing our things to the boats in preparation for our departure. Meanwhile, the Indians remained in deep consultation on the beach, sharpening their arrows. They appeared to be irresolute how to act. Lieutenant Puget ordered a swivel to be fired with grape shot, that they might see we had other resources besides those in our hands. But contrary to our expectation, they did not express any astonishment or fear at the report or the effect of the shot. By this time, our party were united and the major part under arms, and we believe they then totally relinquished all ideas of an attack, for they now offered their bows and arrows for sale, which had shortly before been strung for the worst of purposes and solicited our friendship by the most abject submission. We now felt real satisfaction in not having carried matters to an extremity, but we are still of the opinion that the desire which we entreated the first canoe off the village to come alongside and the presence we made him and had impressed them with an idea we were purchasing their friendship out of fear of the numbers. For when they first came into the cove, we were particularly anxious to purchase their bows, etc., but which they would not part with on any account. How extraordinary, then, that they should so soon alter their opinion, but the reason is obvious. They had on the eve of our departure seen their error and were now glad to sell the garments from their backs. These people were rather more stout than any of our former visitors, and were nearly similar in their ornaments, etc., of what we had seen before. We did not perceive a single sea otter skin among the whole party, but plenty of bear, raccoon, rabbit, and deer used as garments. These they willingly parted with in exchange for our articles. Some of them had thick, bushy beards, others with a tuft only on their chins, and upper lips like mustachios. They had likewise hair in profusion on those parts of the body in common with ourselves, except the breast, which was perfectly destitute. <laughs> we now had quitted the cove and were pulling to the eastward along the south shore of the western arm, followed by the canoes to dispose of what remaining articles were in their possession. But finding we were drawing fast from their habitation, they began to leave us, and in half an hour we were again left to ourselves. But we had the satisfaction of having convinced them of our friendship before their departure. The weather had by this time undergone a total alteration. A southeast breeze had brought with it a perfect deluge of rain, and the approach of night obliged us to seek shelter on the west point of a narrow passage trending to the southward and about five miles from the dinner cove, which had from the conduct of the Indians obtained the name Alarm Cove. On the morning of Tuesday, May 22nd, 
we early proceeded to the further examination of this inlet. We had to pull against a most rapid stream in this narrow south channel, and with great difficulty got through. From thence, we kept going along the south side of an island, which for distinction was called Pigeon Island. At the east point of this island, we found ourselves in the main southern branch again. We pulled over for a long, flat island to obtain a latitude at noon. The latitude was measuring, measuring the sun's height with an octant like this. Across the channel, of about a mile was land that Lieutenant Puget thought to be an island and intended to round it, keeping to the southward, and fall in again with the continent. But immediately after noon, the sky blackened to the southeast, and in a quarter of an hour came a squall with thunder, lightning, and rain, and obliged us to bear away for a cove on the east side of supposed island. We landed about three and intended after dinner to have proceeded on, but the extreme badness of the weather prevented our stirring. We therefore pitched the tents, resolved if possible to sit out earlier in the morning. In the meantime, the cutter, being dispatched for water, saw clearly in the south-southwest channel we had left, which clearly proved the land we were now on to be an island. In the evening, three canoes visited our encampment from a village to the southward with some vegetables like celery. These were immediately purchased together with some bearskins. They paddled away quietly at dark, and though situated close to them, yet we met no interruption during the night. May 23rd, Wednesday. We were disappointed in our expectations on Wednesday morning, May 23rd, for though the rain had ceased, yet it was succeeded by so thick a fog that the boats were scarcely perceptible from the tents. We were detained until eight in the morning, when we again set out and pulled for the supposed termination of the southern arm where from the appearance of the low country we expected to find a river. In stretching over, we were joined by some canoes with various articles for traffic, such as bows and arrows. Their behavior was the opposite to what we had experienced from the Indians in Alarm Cove. These came alongside the boats with the greatest confidence and behaved themselves with with much propriety. A commerce was therefore established for their different articles, which was carried on with the strictest honesty and apparently to the satisfaction of both parties. The water had shoaled quite across to four and five feet that stopped our further progress toward the shore as it was falling tide, and we were fearful of causing more detention, which would have been the case had we grounded. These friendly Indians followed the boats a considerable distance up the west arm, which we were now passing th uh, through. They uh, sold all their articles. In their persons, customs, and manners, they appeared to be of the same tribe with those in Alarm Cove. The only difference is a friendly disposition. Their weapons and paddles are of the same construction. They did not leave us after we had passed the south-southwest channel and still conducted themselves in the most inoffensive and peaceable manner. By noon, we had reached the continental shore that now trended about west and pursued it for 10 miles to an island, where we were glad to stop and erect our tents to avoid a threatening squall from the southeast. About two, it came on with thunder, lightning, and a heavy gust, which continued without intermission all the afternoon. 
the rain fell in perfect torrents. We therefore were obliged to remain in our quarters until next morning. May 24th, Thursday. We again set out early and pursuing the continent, which now trended to the northward of west, by eight we had determined the termination of this branch about 12 miles from Wednesday Island. Here we tried the Seine and caught only one salmon trout. From this termination, we entered another branch, trending in a southwest and southerly and in various directions, but not more than one quarter or one half a mile broad. We continued on until six in the evening when we brought two for the night and dinner. From this situation, we could see a channel to the southeast by which we hoped to return into the main branch through an opening in the opposite shore where the last canoes had left us. Friday, May 25th. The next morning, Friday, May 25th, we had a survey on the provisions which we found would last until Wednesday next. Lieutenant Puget thought it best to, cons to determine this alternative navigation and save the trouble of a second expedition to this extent. We had likewise been successful in procuring a good quantity of clams, nettle tops, fat hen, and gooseberry tops, greatly assisted by the customary allowance of provisions, and the people were not averse to eating crows, of which we could always procure plenty. Therefore, we pursued our examination of the southern narrow inlet. In this branch, we saw many beautiful spots, the low surrounding country, though quickly, thick, quickly covered with wood, had a very pleasant appearance now in the height of spring. We had already passed during this expedition several small deserted villages, which were supposed to be only the temporary habitations of fishermen. We took advantage of the remaining part of the tide to come down as far as possible about five miles from the termination, stopped to dine. In the evening, we were fortunate in reaching the southeast passage, seen from last night's sleeping place, where we pitched our tents in a very pleasant situation. Saturday, May 26th. Early next morning, Saturday, May 26th, with a continuance of favorable weather, we pursued another small branch that nearly ran parallel to the one we had determined yesterday. About an hour after we had set out, an Indian village made its appearance from which some canoes came off perfectly unarmed. We learned we were near the termination of this arm. We landed for a short time and were received by the inhabitants with all the friendship and hospitality we could have expected. These people were about 60 in number of all ages and descriptions. They lived under a kind of shed open at the front and sides. The women appeared employed in domestic duties, such as curing clams and fish, making baskets of various colors, and as neatly woven that they are perfectly watertight. The occupations of the men, we believe, consist chiefly of fishing, constructing canoes, and performing all the laborious work of the village. The natives had but two sea otter skins which were purchased, and a variety of marmot, rabbit, raccoon, deer, and bear skins were also procured. The men had a war garment on. It consisted of a very thick hide, supposed to be made from the moose deer and well prepared. I have no doubt it is a sufficient shield against arrows, though not against arms. The garment reaches from the shoulders down to the knees. This, however, was got in exchange for a small piece of copper, from which we may suppose that they were not of much value. They likewise disposed of some well-constructed bows and arrows. 
In short, it was only to ask and have your wish gratified. The only difference I perceived between our present companions and our former visitors were the extravagance with which their faces were ornamented. Streaks of red ochre and black glimmer were on some, others entirely with the former, and a few that gave the preference to the latter. Every person had a fashion of his own, and to us who were strangers to Indians, this sight conveyed a stranger force of the savageness of the native inhabitants than any other circumstances we had hitherto met with. Not but their conduct, friendly and inoffensive, had merited our warmest approbation, but their appearance was absolutely terrific. In receiving looking glasses, each appeared satisfied with his own fashion. They likewise had the hair covered with the down of birds, which certainly was a good substitute for powder, and the paint only differed in the colors and not the quantity used by our own fair country women. In these two instances, we meet with some resemblance to our customs, and I believe the above mentioned ornaments were of a ceremonious nature for our reception in the village. From Friendly Inlet, we pulled up another in the same direction and land not far from its termination to breakfast, whither the Indians from the last arm had followed us. Here they made signs that this branch was the same as their own, which after a quarter of an hour's row we found to be the case. From this we pursued the continental shore till one in the afternoon. Then soon we reached the former western branch, which we had visited on Wednesday morning. As all the share of the southern inlet is compact on its east side, we are certain of the continent to the branch we left on Sunday. In that direction, where we had a view of the high snowy mountain, Lieutenant Puget therefore determined to return immediately to the ships, that no time might be lost in the examination of that branch. In the evening, we reached the southern branch from whence we saw a fire on Long Island, where we had landed on Tuesday last. But supposing it to be Indians and having a fair wind and tide, we proceeded down towards the ships, now carrying as much breeze as the sails could bear. It was not until two in the morning that we got on board and were glad to find Captain Vancouver had gone to examine the other branch. This he had completed the day after our arrival and which branch brought him by the foot of the high snowy mountain into our southern inlet. Hello. <laughs> so, if any of you run into Errol in the next few days, be sure to tell him that uh, Abel Seaman, Adam Brown did a wonderful job <laughs> in his place. And uh, I think I should share with you that uh, what uh, Seaman Brown told me, he sewed every single bit of his costume by hand. I think except the hat, right? <laughs> if you can imagine that. So come up later and take a look. <laughs> So as we all know, there's two sides to every story, and uh, as history buffs, we should always seek to find the whole story and all the sides possible. And I can't think of a better person to share the other side of this story with us than Danny Marshall, who is here with us tonight. He's the chair of the Stillicum tribe. He's been tri tribal chair since 2006, and his mother Joan was held that position for uh, over 30 years before him. So he knows what he's talking about. So would you make Danny Marshall welcome, please? Thank you so much. I will see if I can adjust this to the right place so I don't <laughs> blow your ears out. A little bit of echo there. I'll step back a little bit, maybe. How's that? Ah, that, that sounds good. 
So it, it's great that uh, we had Seaman Adam here because hearing it, as much as possible the story told from their perspective gives us an opportunity to uh, think about what they were going through. And at the same time, uh, I'm hoping I can give you some insight into uh, what was being experienced by the Native people and maybe some of the reactions that, that the crew received as they uh, met up with those people. So this isn't the first time that they would have had boats into their area that, that were occupied by pale-faced people. And, and in the tradition of, of our uh, culture, we just recognize them as the new people to the area. Uh, these people obviously looked different. They had some uh, boats that were constructed differently than, than ones we had seen before, but it wouldn't have been the first time. So there's a familiarity with the, uh, the, uh, at least the, the transportation of, of people through our waters and uh, what that might mean. Uh, traditionally, though, uh, the, the biggest fear that the uh, people on Puget Sound had was a visitation not from uh, the people in those uh, well put together boats with, with swivels and other weapons on board, but it was the large canoes that came down from the, the Canada area and the Tlingit people who, who were uh, coming to capture slaves and take back home with them. So uh, the traditional uh, way of responding to that uh, is not going to surprise you when you hear about some of what happened and what Peter Puget's uh, crew experienced while he was here. So uh, when uh, a canoe full of uh, outsiders that uh, were coming with dastardly deeds uh, at heart uh, were coming into the water, uh, it was a very loud process. And, and not scary, but, but it was a signal. And you would think that, that maybe that was uh, to their own demise because the canoes as they traveled down through usually had maybe 10, 12 uh, people on both sides of these large canoes. And every time they took a stroke in the water, they'd take that canoe paddle and bang it against the side. So it was a, a stroke, then a bang, stroke, and bang. And so you'd hear this bang, 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 and coming down through the water. Not that quickly, but, but in between strokes, it was, uh, it was quite a uh, event. And so when you heard that, uh, what you would do is, you wouldn't run and grab your bow and arrows and prepare for that because you had plenty of time to run into the forest and hide. And that's what happened. They weren't there to capture the old people and the children. They could stay in the village and continue on their normal activities, although sometimes children were taken away. But that really wasn't the, uh, the norm. Uh, but the, the people would go into the forest and hide. So essentially... Uh, war tactics for the Puget Sound tribes were more based on uh, defense than they were offense. And part of that defense was to put on a, uh, at least an image that you uh, could be fierce if you were required to. Uh, so the first experience that Peter Puget had uh, was what we might think of as the, the bully boys of the tribe who were sent out. Uh, the guys with the one eye, the, the more stout guys, these were the ones that were out to actually put some fear into those people that were there. First of all, they determined that, hey, they're not coming to capture slaves and take them somewhere else. They are traveling through. We need to determine the intent here. But we don't know if it's positive or negative because usually outsiders don't come into the area uh, to visit unless they're invited, uh, and, and that's quite often what would happen if we were celebrating an event, a, a potlatch that uh, kind of created our whole celebration of coming together for potlucks of today. Those potlatches were announced you know, across the water everywhere, and everybody was invited, but you knew that that was the time and people were traveling in these large groups of canoes. So the norm really was, you know, maybe one or two canoes traveling to get from one place to the other. That large group of canoes you heard about at one point they were coming in, those were the ones that those bully boys went back and gathered up and said, you know what, I think we might be able to scare these guys off, actually. 
Uh, why don't we gather some more people? And they, they probably were from various tribes as well. So uh, each tribe maybe, and, and a village of a tribe, would maybe have two or three canoes that, that could come together with a large number of people and head out on something like this. But I think there were seven canoes, and then another one arrived. And, and as that was happening, uh, you got people from different tribes that had heard the word, right? So now think back for a moment, traditional bang, bang, bad guys are coming, let's hide in the forest. Well, at least when they were on, was it Crow Island where they shot off the guns? So when they were at Crow Island uh, and they shot those guns off, it said, okay, so we recognize that at least there might be some danger here. But I don't know if there was much experience of the result of a musket yet or even a swivel and the grape shot. If you know what the grape shot is, that's, that's like multiple bullets all together that spread out. And so they can do some damage. I think for the most part in, in, in sea, for sea travel and warfare, it was more about taking down somebody's sail than, than doing high intense damage to an individual. But, but obviously there was a result there that, that nobody had experienced before. So shooting the guns, that's not gonna scare them off necessarily because all right, so we already know you're here, so you're sending us another signal that you're on the way, and we get that. You sent us the signal, so what are we going to do? We're going to get our bigger group. Now word travels around. We, we can get around pretty good on land at the same time and get people organized and back out there. So word travels around. They gather the people up and say, let's go ahead and scare them out of here then. So they've told us they're on their way. We heard a couple of pops, and, and maybe that's how... And you know what? Nobody knows this right now, but I, I bet if we go back and ask, what's the name for a musket? It's called pop. You know, uh, in our language, the word, and, and this, is a, this will be a, one you can remember because it's easy for me to remember as well. Our, our word for uh, cat, like a house cat, is puss puss. <laughs> Why? We didn't have house cats. It's like... No, a cat is a pet. There were mountain lions, cougars, uh, lynx, other wild cats here. But, but a cat living with, among people as a pet, they called those pussy cats. We called them puss puss. And so the name for a musket, maybe that ended up being pop at some point uh, until they were informed, no, that's not really what it is. But can I trade? How about a, a bow for a pop? Did you hear about any guns getting traded? Later on, I think that did happen, especially when uh, uh, the Brits were uh, being informed by the Americans that uh, their uh, title to the land was being revoked somewhat, and they were going to have to move north a ways, and Americans would take claim to uh, territory for the south of the 49th parallel. But even at that time, then, uh, there weren't many guns among the tribes. We did go through a period of of Indian War at that time in 1854 through 56, and uh, there were guns. Those came from the Brits in, in the form of Canadians who supplied those to the to tribes. And in fact, with this message, let's let's take these guns. You guys can have some of them, and we'll get rid of the Americans. You guys just have to help us. So life was good without the Americans, right? So let's get back to the way it used to be. Here's some guns. We'll work this out. Uh, and that's another whole story. <laughs> um, Peter Puget, though, I think uh, uh, had an opportunity to do some things that, that did not happen very often, often within uh, this area because not many people uh, came and recorded the history and the uh, the, the vision of what they saw. Uh, there weren't a lot of historical writers that actually uh, recorded that. We've got some, uh, some individuals that attempted that, but, but usually not into uh, the early 1900s at the earliest. So much had changed from 1792 until uh, the 1900s. 
And so uh, this early glimpse was very important. I considered uh, trying to match our seaman with his costume today, but realized I might be a little cold because my costume would have only consisted of the headband and nothing else. So, <laughs> in fact, I, I thought well, at least I'll t attempt that halfway. And, I, and my wife knows I, I had shorts on earlier in my red and black style. Uh, and, and that was going to be, but no, I decided it was even maybe not warm enough for that yet. So what they experienced uh, amongst trying to make a, f a friendship was, was quite normal uh, because the, the tradition of the, the tribal people here in Puget Sound was one where you build strength and you build uh, community through uh, building relationships. So that was their strongest desire. As soon as they could determine that, number one, there wasn't ill intent uh, applied, uh, number two, that we weren't going to be able to scare them off, and, and, and that, that maybe they were genuinely here to, to be helpful. Do we need our bows and arrows any longer at that point? Probably not. Uh, uh, the question about the value of that garment, though, I'll tell you what, the piece of copper they received, one of the most valuable resources for, resources for the tribal people ever. Even today in our uh, traditional canoe journeys that we do contemporarily, uh, one of the symbols that uh, canoe family members carry is a copper ring that they put on a, uh, on a leather strap. And every member of a canoe family today, contemporarily, uh, when they uh, go on their first journey, they get that copper ring with some pledges and other things that go along with that, but, but then are, are adding a bead to that each time they, they do another journey, which, is, which has been fantastic but it's because it's given us an opportunity to bring back a piece of the culture that, that wasn't needed uh, any longer, uh, but was such an important part of the history of the people. And so that garment and, and, the, and the recognition of, of what they experienced in the village that day was significant to the point that here's what they saw. This was a village of people that said, hey, we've got some visitors. Let's, let's treat this like we do our, our potlatches, which is really about there, there's a big gift giving process that goes along with that. Now, in this case, they were lucky enough to have some things returned back, but that garment, the, the moose deer, I thought that was pretty cool. So you, you recognize what a moose deer is likely, probably an elk. I'm saying that that because we didn't have moose down at, at this level, but but I'm sure to them that was like that was a significant beast. So and, and significant to the tribal people as well. So if I had a garment, elk skin is much thicker than 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 deer skin. So if I had a garment made out of that, that that could have been for uh, armor, but it really was just his dress garment. It's like, I'm, I'm dressing up for this celebration of the, the, the new people that are coming to visit with us. And, and at some point, you know, I'm willing to take it off. And even if I'm standing there naked afterwards, it's like, yeah, take this. Because you know what? That piece of copper I got, we don't have that. We didn't, we didn't mine ore and or process it to create that kind of thing. You saw that one arrow I thought was pretty cool that you had the picture of the arrow collected uh, in Vancouver's journey. The tip on that was made out of bone. And so, so we, we did have stone tips as well, but, but bone and stone, that was, that was quickly transpired to metal as soon as it was available. If you come to the Stolicum Tribal Cultural Center at some time over across the water, uh, we've got some arrows there that have metal points on there. We've got some other canoe carving tools that also have some metal pieces on there. But we know something about the metal that was in those. Those were the metal that they used to, to replace the, the stone tips that they used that were very sharp and they could use for carving came from wagon wheels. So the, the metal rim around the outside of the wagon wheel, they, they grabbed those as quickly as possible, carved those up into whatever they could use them for. So um, metal was, was significant. And then the other thing that, that they hadn't caught on to yet by that point, but blankets. And, and there was, uh, I'm a little surprised about the, the potential for smallpox at that time. It's possible that, that smallpox had already reached, but we know that smallpox had a significant impact on the populations of the, of the early uh, Puget Sound tribes. And, 
And some of that was, was done purposefully as well in, in the trade of blankets because dr blankets were, were a significant resource as well. Th those two things uh, could have almost gotten you anything. So it's like your wish could be met. Whatever you wanted to trade for, if you had a blanket uh, or a piece of copper. I'm not so sure what they made out of the looking glasses yet. Those things probably didn't have much. They were curi curiosity at the time uh, because nothing like that existed. But, but they probably got you know, given to the children to play with later on. <laughs> uh, didn't have, except for maybe we could harvest some metal off the outside of those the, and, and, and the glass. So already at that time, the, one of the things that they would have had is because we, and we know that, that we had some visitors prior to Peter Puget, is the Russians had come through and, and done some exploration as well. Guess what? We don't know much about that whole stuff because America hasn't been so good about you know, keeping track of what happens and, and, and the history of Russia. We're not so good about documenting our own history uh, as we could be. Uh, but a lot of that information is, has been lost. And even prior to the Russians, the Chinese were actually traveling all the way from down around California up to Alaska on the coast as well. So they had passed through. Russians we had uh, received some, some glass beads from. So another uh, high value item were some uh, blue Russian beads that were, were trade beads that they used. And so strings of those were, were very important because Otherwise, the beads that we made were, were really out of shell and bone and things like that. So, so all those things were significant. Yes, happy to have the people in trade with. That was part of a big party. Nobody had down in their hair under, on normal days, but they were dressing up. They were dressing up for that, that event, and including that, that special elk skin robe. Uh, elk was, was revered as, as the grandfather animal out there with a lot of wisdom and spirit that came from that. So, so the person that had that could have been somebody of, of quite importance in the tribe as well and willing to trade that off for, for whatever he got, a piece of copper. It was a piece of copper. That was, that was pretty significant. I think that uh, able-bodied seaman Adam and I are available to answer some questions for you if you guys want to uh, share or ask questions and, and get some additional information. I'm going to ask the, the seaman to come back up and uh, we'll go ahead and, and be prepared to answer any questions or provide some additional comments if you have or want more info. So I was reading his words that he recorded uh, during the trip and then later uh, was turned into the Admiralty Office in London and is preserved for us still today. Available by internet now. So access to that from, from London is, is significant. I heard about that that record before, but had never seen it until Harold had, the, the seaman and his predecessor before he converted uh, had shared it with me. So, so yeah, we, we are definitely blessed with a lot more information today than we have been before. Even in the old days, when I used to go back and do research to get some of this stuff from the National Archives, uh, I was impressed by the fact I could bring a roll of microfilm, which was about this thick and on spindles that we could you had to go to the library to actually read it, but, <laughs> but we could bring back microfilm rolls of, of, of information that, pretty significant, you know, original documents that, that my wife and I both got to put our hands on, signed by some of the people back in those times. We never did see an original Medicine Creek Treaty. I would love to see that. Uh, I think that there's enough controversy over what really happened with that and, and where, where the originals went and whose exes really were placed by the, the Indians who supposedly signed that uh, is, is somewhat circumspect as well. So, Because we know, for, for example, if you guys know the story about Leshai, who was, the, we'll call him notorious, but a, a heroic, notorious uh, member of the Nisqually tribe, 
uh, stomped out of the Medicine Creek Treaty Council and refused to sign the treaty, but his name is on the treaty and, and it does have an X. <laughs> So, so we know some of the names, uh, uh, and, and, and even earlier, Brit was here in the area by the name of Francis Drake. I'm sure, I, I know the last name was Drake, but Francis, I think, is the first name. Does that, does that sound right? He was a pirate, if you, if you don't know the history of Francis Drake, but he, he operated out of Oregon as, in the coast there and actually got knighted by the queen for his... Uh, ability to take care of the Spanish in, in, in ways that they wanted taken care of. And, and you know, that's the other part about Peter's journey was that that was a significant requirement for Peter Puget when he came in here and Vancouver, uh, Vancouver precisely, that, that they were to, to resolve this issue that was still going on on Vancouver Island with some controversy between the Spanish and the, and the British at that time. So I can't remember the name of the, the, the Russian names, which I'm sure looked very Russian that, that I saw on this. But yes, there is a little bit of history you can get on that. It's not very extensive, though. We just knew that they were traveling in the area, and there was records of them at least being on the coast. And then we have the evidence of the, of the beads, which we know the, are specifically Russian glass trade beads that were even in my family as well that were passed down. That's a good question and something that I, I should have mentioned as, we, as I presented is that, that all of the encounters they had uh, were really off the mainland and those, none of those would have been permanent villages. So they, especially at this time of the year, they were probably harvesting salmon. Uh, and, and the description, I think the picture that was on there wasn't an accurate picture of what those kind of temporary villages would have looked like. They would have just had a top on them, and it, he did describe them as, as open on the front and the sides, but that would have been it. So it, you're out there, and, and maybe you have some lumber that you bring with you, some cedar planks that come and, and, and or are moved around and placed to provide shelter for people there. Could have been a significant size of village, one of, one of my favorite photos, we have this giant mural in the Stillicum Tribal Cultural Center that, that depicts a, one of, what one of these villages may have looked like early 1900. Uh, and, it's, and you can see like uh, three individuals that are there and some smoke rising out of places where salmon is being uh, cured. But, but it, it, and canoes pulled up on the shore. Uh, and so those, those were reality. The Stillicum Tribe, uh, the closest village we had to the shore was was up in Chambers Bay, and, and then the other four permanently occupied villages for the Stillicum were, were more inland around the lakes and Spanaway, Clover Creek, and Saguachu, those areas. So yeah, the, the villages that they encountered, the, the tribes would have stayed to the mainland and traveled there for purpose. And so canoe over, maybe several canoes, harvest, bring the stuff back to the longhouse. This was an important time. I think they'd already been, they'd already experienced spring and they were out. And so one of my favorite stories is about the kids emerging out of the longhouse at the, at the, after the long winter. Because we're talking about traditional clothing is really nothing, so you don't have anything to wear when you're out there. Yeah, some cedar bark capes and skirts that were traditional as well, but but not necessarily needed. And then in the longhouse, they, they were warm and toasty, several fires burning at each of the family's places within the longhouse, but long winter of eating that stuff that you stored up over the spring and the summer, spring came, you were out there and celebrating. And, and boy, and this was a hot spring, 90 degrees. No, no sense wearing clothes when it's 90 degrees outside. So no permanent villages out there. And, and, and closest villages pr probably were, were Puyallup, Nisqually, and Stillicum in the territory that we explored tonight. And, 
And, and, and so you recognize because you know more about tribal relations today than, than, than most people do, that there are reservations that were formed as a part of the Medicine Creek Treaty that include something called the Squaxin Island Indian Reservation, which was not a tribe, by the way. Thankfully, the, the name Squaxin came out of uh, a part of the tribes that, that, were, that occupied that reservation, but historically, there was no Squaxin Island Indian tribe. That doesn't exist. Worst, worst example of that is like the Colville tribe that is named Colville tribe. They're the Colville tribes, incorporated tribes of Colville. But anyways, they're named after Colonel Colville. And so it's like now, yeah, so my tribe is the Colville tribe. That would be like, we're the, I guess we could be the Puget, Peter Puget. So it's like the Puget tribe, yeah, because we had the Puget reservation. So the Puget Indian tribe. If you guys want to uh, see some cool stuff about that, recently uh, Puyallup, Nisqually, Stillicum, and Squaxin all came together on a, on a podcast with uh, the Living History Museum of Fort Nisqually. And it's all on YouTube now. You guys are all good YouTube experts. So, so you go out there on YouTube and look at those recordings because some great interaction with that. And um, Warren King George, my friend from Muckleshoot, who, who is a part of that panel with us, uh, I, I remember him very significantly at the end of one of those sharing that we are thankful for the Muckleshoot Reservation because it created a village space for us. We're not the Muckleshoot Indian tribe. They didn't exist, but the Muckleshoot Reservation does, and that's the village that the creation of that created a place for my people to come and survive and live together in a place that, that Stillicum didn't get just because the rest of that story was you will not have a reservation in Stillicum just because that was planned to be a big place for other people to live, not for the Indians. <laughs> um, yes, Saturday, 10 to 4. <laughs> Saturday, 10 to 4, yeah. Used to be when, when my mother was still there, uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4. And man, she covered all those hours but th and allowed us to work and actually make a living while she sacrificed for us. But we're hoping, we've got some big stuff going on right now. You're going to see some renovation of our building and stuff that, that is done through a Washington State Capital Budget Project this this year, it's already it's out for bid just this week. So, so we'll see some things happening there, and and hopefully, uh, we'll see some some progress in getting some more hours established as well. We it, it definitely we run completely by volunteers, like like you guys do at the Historical Society. Nobody gets paid, so we get a few retired people that are part of our council and volunteers that are there, but but it's still hard to to maintain that. Definitely happy to see you on a Saturday. I won't be there every Saturday, but I am sometimes. And if we're closed, my our daughter, who's also in the tribal council, she posts on Facebook. We didn't have a volunteer for an hour. Yeah, you can you can actually look on Facebook on our on our blog page and, and see if something happens and we're not open. To try and keep people away, you think? Was it on purpose? Well, I think so, but... Um, or, or is that where everybody recycled their broken glass? Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of our impression was it was to either keep people from landing there or maybe from children from going into the water. Huh. I don't know why. I don't know. I think I, uh, it would be interesting to, to hear, because there's multiple ways to view that, right? But it's possible that it could have been any one of those. And 
And I have not heard of a plot where, hey, let's figure out a way to keep the people off our beaches by breaking glass out there. It's probably from China. <laughs> that, and that's true. So you, you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to find one of those glass floats around here, there, there's another way that we did fl floats here in the Puget Sound for our nets. But, but if you can find them, they, you, they are from China. So sometimes those floats actually do come across. It's been a long time since I think anybody's ever found one out there. But they could be churning around out there in the water somewhere. Could be good discovery. It was wood. Yeah, and then and they had stones for the other side. And so, and, and we've got some examples. I, th I think we have at least one that's the anchor side of the net that, that it would be tied to. So the nets were all made out of cedar bark uh, and, and strands of that. If you haven't worked with cedar bark, my headband is cedar bark. It can be very fine and tightly woven. Uh, uh, it, it can be very soft. Baby diapers were, were made out of cedar bark, and, and the, gra the skirts, the cedar bark skirts that the women wore as a traditional garment really looked like a Hawaiian grass skirt. And so it was pretty, pretty uh, good material, but, but the, an, enough to shred and strength within that to make a net, weave a net out of that, and then uh, the wooden floats, and, and you can get some pretty good float for that. Probably not as good as, as glass, and, and sometimes, I mean, you can go elaborate because we did trade for stuff outside of the area as well. Uh, our logo, which, which you see there, is uh, actually, uh, I say everything was defensive in nature for our people, but that's actually a whalebone club that would have been used for uh, war. And so... Uh, it never, I don't think it ever did, except for it wasn't carved here in the Puget Sound, but it was uh, carried by one of the earliest leaders of the Stilicum tribe. And so for us, it represented the one artifact that was in a museum somewhere at the Burke Museum at University of Washington uh, that was identified as, as a piece that was carried by a leader of the Stilicum tribe. And so it's probably... Probably that long and uh, looks like a whalebone on one end and club wise and and that's the top part of it <laughs> so yeah did trade for other stuff including you could make a nice float out of a, a seal belly so sew that up and blow it full of air are they taking uh, taking the dam off on that Okay. Yeah. So leach ties into what I still refer to as Stillicum Creek, but on the maps it says Chambers Creek today. Yeah. I don't, I don't know about those efforts as much as I know that there is some work in process and I think even scheduled to remove the dam on, on Stillicum Creek. Yeah. Yes. It probably, sig probably significantly slowed down because, you know, we have a major um, sewage treatment plant run by Pierce County right to the, to the north of the creek there. And a lot of sewer lines go across and there's you know some importance about how you deal with that yeah yeah and so with leech as well okay and I'm sure that that whatever happens with Chambers Creek will will impact what what eventually can happen with leech too I, I think that we're doing some great stuff. I, th there, there are dams that aren't necessary any longer, like the one on, on Stillicum Chambers Creek. That's, that's not a dam that does anything for anybody, uh, except for the, the people that like to, to water plane on the other side of it in the shallow water, uh, and that's nice for them. Uh, but there was one on Spanaway Creek as well, 
and, and they remove that one out and, and, and open the water up again. I think that that's important for, for the fishing. I don't know. I think, I think his crew didn't do such a good job, except for maybe he was the wrong time of day. We know that in order to catch those fish, you have to do it at nighttime. And I think they were probably, when he said seining, that's their way of throwing a net out and dragging it around the fish and trying to bring it back in, kind of like they create a purse and, and sew the fish up in there and pull it out, and they had one. That guy was just unlucky. He was down there in the water going by at whatever time. So, yeah, most of the time they're out there. You do that just around the mouth of the creek when it's nighttime. So they're still out there. Not enough, apparently. They are endangered. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand the mic back over to Rick. And say thank you guys for being a good audience. Yes. Well, that's that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Adam, Danny. Thank you, and, and Mrs. Marshall. Thank you for joining us. And um, why don't we get together a big bunch of people and go over and see that museum one of these days, huh? <laughs> Thanks. We we'll hope we'll see you again.